Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my host, Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by AutoClose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, why don't you tell the audience what we're going to be talking about today? That was the longest welcome you've ever done. I've been practicing it. I was told it was three seconds. I tried to drag that on for at least four to five this time. If um, if Daniel could do like a 25 second version of that, that would be very funny. But um, today, as of a recent recording that we did, we're going to piggyback off of that. So uh, we talked about how to raise capital and what to do with it and how it all works. Now it's it's in your bank and how are you going to deal with it? So there's a, a bunch of different things, um, some of which I, I'll already know and some things that you'll have to explain to me. So things like you've got runway, how long should you plan for and how do you calculate it? Things like that. You've also got to work out how much um, like percentage of your profit do you want to keep aside for building the bank and to, to like build for next projects, but also you want to be hiring. So that's going to take chunks out of it. You've got to manage the kind of ebbs and flow of that budget and the money coming in versus going out. There'll be a bunch of other things that a founder like you who was um, who's been there and done that would know. So teach me from the start. What what did I not come up with there in terms of managing your money when you've got it sat in the bank as a founder? Okay, well the the, the first things first. The number one thing is you want to have a cash management plan. Okay, you do want to have a plan. Now, my, everyone's different. I mean, depending on what kind of business you are, you want to be different. For example, we are a we were a SaaS recurring business. So we wanted to have a certain amount because we also knew that we had recurring revenue coming in each month. So I always tell people that I, you know, I talk to that you do want to typically have 12 to 18 months of runway in the bank, right? Um, and the reason why is nobody knew COVID was going to hit. And, that, and, and what happened was I know a lot of people that had three months of runway in the bank and it was like COVID hit and oops, uh, everything shut down. What do you do? So you want to have 12 to 18 months. Me personally, um, you, one thing you mentioned was like a profitability, which is another sector is, is what I did was I always wanted 12 months because I, I, I was, you know, I've always been a hustler and I've always found a way and that's just my mentality. But I had 12 months, but I actually never took profit for my first 18 months, meaning I didn't take a cent out. Whenever we got down to 12 months in the bank or over 12 months, sorry, 13 months, 14 months, I'm like, oh, we got money, reinvest. What does that mean? Hire somebody, more marketing dollars, sales dollars, go to an event, do something. But I always kept 12 months in there. So it's like almost like a savings account where that 12 months sits there and then whatever goes into my checking account was what I can spend. Um, so that's what I did early on. Um, but I also focused on a few other things to try and save and manage cash flow. One was always continue to look at how you can reduce your customer churn. They're your customers. They're paying you recurring. That's how you're managing your money try and lower that. Um, and then the second thing I would say before we continue was um, my invoicing. A lot of companies say, okay, we're going to invoice twice a month, the 15th and the 30th. No, you don't get to use my product unless I invoice and you pay. So I actually invoiced before. Money was in my bank before you were taking any of my resources for customer success, support, or anything. And that was one thing that I did early on. So we always got paid up front for everything. Um, and a lot of companies don't do that, which I do recommend because people can take advantage of you. So those would be like the two, uh, I would say. But, you know, ideally, you want to be, make sure that you are saving for the worst. COVID was really bad. Um, and you want to make sure you're saving for that. Yeah. Payment up front is um, it's a, it's just absurd to not do it, in my opinion. Like maybe that's a hot take. I don't think it is. But you would never leave a store without paying. So why do you, you can't just be eating your chips on the way home? It's, it's bizarre. So that one, yeah, absolutely. I've never bought any product, service, tool, anything without paying for it straight away in business, never mind other things. Um, so what you're doing there is you kind of said that you're keeping it on. We need this much money to keep everything going at like a core level. And then you multiply that by 12 and that's your one year of runway number at current time. And obviously every month that you may hire or you may whatever, and it, and it impacts that number. You're going to update that in your spreadsheet and then that updates your 12X yep. number that. And then beyond that, anything else that you've got in the bank, if it's less or below, you know what to do there. So you know I've got 20,000 extra. That could be an event or it could be a part-time resource or it could be something else. So at what point, because I know that was for the first while, and then obviously you've got to start to make an income too as you've kind of invested your time and your own capital. At what point do you strip that back a little bit or 
have more runway but less profitability stuff baked in? How do you kind of manage the transition? So what what I would what I used to do is I used to lower actually that twelve month runway because what would happen is when you're doing a recurring model, you can forecast what's coming in every month, right? So for me, I knew if I stopped everything, I fired all my developers, fired success, fired support, did absolutely nothing. I was still having this amount of thousands of dollars coming in every month. So I knew I was still okay. But it takes a little time to get to that point. So I'm talking about until you get to that point where you're almost a break even. So for us, early on, our break even, and I'll tell it, was about 40 grand a month in salaries and costs. You know, so so once we hit that 40K in MRR, then you know, okay, uh, if I fired everyone, I'm, I'm still bringing in 40K a month. So it, it's all about a calculation. Then that 12 month became almost down to eight, and then that down to six. So by the end of it, we ended up having about six. But I also knew that with that six months in the bank, within six months, I'm going to make six months worth of, of money back. Yeah. So I'm, ideally, I'm at 12, but six is in, uh, in future um, accounts receivables. So that, that was that because you were going monthly? Would you have felt as comfortable doing that if you had even annual? Let's say, a, well, not everybody does only annual, but you can have a heavier percentage skewed to annual renewals, to like a G2 model where you're paying for the year's stuff. And if it's crap after like four months, you know you're not going to renew, but you've got like eight months to go before the money doesn't come back again. See, it's a little different with annuals because with annuals, you have no clue throughout the year if they're for sure coming back or not. With the month to months, when you give them, you have to give me 30 days notice, you know you have one more month paid. So with, with annuals, it's, it's a bit different. I never did the annuals just because we were always in that startup to small um, businesses. But if you're in a medium-sized business or enterprise, you're looking for those annuals, your calculations got to be a lot different. But by that time, you're probably in the you know five to 10 million ARR. Uh, so it's a different it's a different strategy at that point. With mine, it was you have 30 days notice you have to give, your month to month, so I knew if every client canceled tomorrow, I was still getting a 40K within a month. So yeah. That's how I did my calculation. Yeah, it's with the monthly, you can be a little bit more, I was about to say you can roll the dice. That's not what I meant. You can be a little bit more flexible, pivot, yes. change what you're doing. But with the annuals, you need to bake in a bit more conservatism because you're not as sure. Like you can always, there's always surprises and there's always ones that you know are definitely going to renew. But because it's monthly, you and you haven't had the notice yet, you know you're getting another building cycle. And that and that enables just that extra bit of... So at what point, like this is a, a little bit of a different question. At what point do you then start to introduce more annual? Because then it's um, it's, it seems like every company in the world has this thing where it's we'll start small and we'll be, we'll move fast, break shit is the phrase. And we'll, we'll do that kind of, we can tweak our runway levels that we're going to keep because we get 30 day recurring revenue. We have that in our advantage. Then we're getting a bit bigger and this is a little bit too much work and we want to get bigger deals and work a little bit less hard yeah. and we do annuals. And then we go a little bit more mid-market because it's the same thing. And then we go enterprise. So at what points do those things come into your mind? Look, um, take me to the point when you're, um, you're keeping 12, 18 months and then you're now baking in some of your own money coming out because it's now time for you to yeah. get paid. At what point do those things come in your mind? So for me, I, I, I never took money out of the company. I, I only took a salary, right? So I kept all the money in the company. But what I would do in that case with the annuals is I would take your annuals and look at what your churn rate is. I say, okay, my churn rate's 10%. Okay. When I do my cash flow management plan, my churn rate's 25%. So what I'm doing there is saying, okay, it's 10% now, but I'm actually going to calculate everything on a 25% churn. So I'm giving myself that 15% buffer in the bank. So th those are different strategies because listen, annual deals are way better, but at the same time, it's it's tough to know through the year unless you have a CSM that's working with them all the time, you know, on those renewals. So I always, as I said, you always always have a buffer. Um, I, I know there's a company um, I used to work for, uh, and they kept three months runway, and it came down to sometimes he had to pull money out of his own bank account to pay off his employees because it was just, you know, schools paying. September before the school year and it was May 
and they got the invoice, but nobody's in school at, at no in a university in May. They only come back when they come back to school in June, for example, or whenever they come back. So for three months, he had to pay without it, but most of his revenue was coming from schools, and he had to pull it out of his own money. So I always buffer those numbers. That's what I would do and recommend to the audience if they if they're in that situation. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in that guy's situation. That'll be um that'll be quite stressful. Okay, so here's something that you might um. You might have found difficult. I think that I would find this difficult. It's probably something you crowdsource or you can look up, but it's difficult in your planning and then you have to adjust if you get this wrong. So let's say you're looking at, I've got my 12 months of runway and then I've got X aside. Let's call it 50,000 for a nice round number. And I would like to do three things with that. I'd like to have some more development resource, call it part-time or external, however. I'd also like to have a hand in the marketing team and also some CSM help. So that's three things. That 50K doesn't stretch to all three. Maybe you thought that it did. So what do you do then? Because I, for instance, today, I wouldn't know roughly what to hire a developer for, especially if you've got varying levels of um, experience um, and proficiencies in certain types of code and different platforms and things like that, way above my head. Or a salesperson, I would know loosely, this is cheap, this is expensive, this is the experience level I'm looking at. So I could probably do that and a marketer I sure could, but particularly technical people and CSM, I'd have no idea. And the compensation for that too. Yep. If I've banked my plan on saying, no, no, we're going to go for annual deals because we're getting to that point. I want two new CSMs because they're going to look after those deals and make sure we keep them. But if I've got my math wrong and the salaries are wrong, problem. So how, how did you, I'm sure that at some point you got that a little bit wrong and you had to pivot. How does that work? So with me, anytime I do a higher night, 50,000, I have to split it up. What I used to do is, I always used to put the max I can pay somebody. So I'd have the max I can pay a customer success, the max I can pay a developer, et cetera. And I'd look at my numbers and be like, okay, and I'd interview people. You know, one person would say, I want 90K. Okay, well, you know, I I can't afford it within my budget. So everything everything is a budget. Now, you know, how do you decide if you want marketing or CSM? It all depends. Like I would calculate, okay, how many CSMs do I need per customer? Meaning for every 100 users, I need one CSM. Okay, well, I have 130. You know what? They can probably deal with that for the short term. So I'm going to push away the CSM, but focus on the marketing. But then once that 130 becomes 160, then you got to. But again, you don't want to ever get too low on money. So if I got too low, I mean, I didn't have to. I would then go look to raise. Because the last thing you want to do as a CEO, and, and, and I've been there, is stress about you're already stressing about your day-to-day -day and your growth. And I, I spoke to a CEO just yesterday and he was talking to me and he's telling me, he's like, we're not, we're not developing quick enough. We have people coming in the industry. Um, they're kind of, you know, they're coming in quick. They're bringing money in. They're putting capital. They're developing twice as quick. They're going to steal our market share. They have the same messaging, the same mission, the same vision. You don't want to be like that. You don't want to be catching up. You don't want to be the person behind. So with the 50K, you want to make sure you spend it with a budget. And if not, go raise more money. Yeah, difficult one. So say you just mentioned um, 100 users to one CSM. Like Obviously, that could be accurate for some companies, wildly inaccurate for others. Take, take me back to being that I don't know what to pay a developer mode. You want a CSM or you want a developer. How can you work out how to pace and deal with that? Because that's a core part of your plan. If you know you need three CSM because you have 320 users, cool. But how the hell do you get to that number? Because if you ask me and I'm the CSM, I want the low, I want the number to be low, don't I? Like I don't want to deal with two million customers. Yeah. Obviously, you'd hope I'm like honest, but how how do you work that out? Because that's that's not like a binary number. I would start looking at statistics. I'd be like, okay, all of our customers, how much time do they use of our CSM? Okay, they each use 46 minutes a week or a month, whatever that might be. And you just do all the calculations. Well, a CSM works eight hours a day, five times a week is 40 hours. So they have 40 hours. Minus five hours for lunch, you know, internal calls. They have 30 hours, say. Okay, in 30 hours, we can only, he can only do, you know, 30 calls of an hour a week, 120 a month. So he only has time for 120. So we have 130. We know that CSM doesn't have time. So it's all, everything's data. You have to look at the numbers. And a lot of companies don't look at the numbers, but you have to look at the numbers to make any decision or any assumption that you're going to do. So that's how I would look at it. And I always look at it from dissecting, not, not like how to, uh, dissecting backwards. So I'll look at those 120 hours, take vacation days, take all that stuff and move my way forward to say, okay, 
this person can only deal with 87 customers. Once I hit 80, they're at the peak. And you speak to them. Be like, Ollie, are you at your, like, where are you with your bandwidth? I'm at 100. Well, explain to me how you're at 100. Show me how your day goes. Oh, so you can handle a few more. Okay. Well, I think you can handle this. So that's how I would work it. Okay. So you're going to have a whole bunch of co- um, confusing sums and, and all these things that you're going to keep track of. I'm assuming this is amazingly huge, massive Excel file, or you've got some kind of tool. Is it both? Or are you paying for something? Or how do you do that? Where does it, where does uh, it live? Uh, great question. I You're going to laugh, but I used to just build these models by myself when it came up. I wish I was more... Um, uh, I wish I had more stuff and saved and templates saved, but literally I would come up with it and then build a model, take a look at the model and then update the model. So I built all this stuff from scratch, didn't use a software. I don't even know there was software that did all this stuff for me back when I started in 2014. But uh, I did uh, every Excel spreadsheet myself and had it all updated real time. I didn't even integrate it with stuff. So it was really a manual task that I did that took a lot of time. But yeah, I, I like can see you drawing on napkins and then, you know, doing quick formulas for the sums and yeah. In Excel. And yeah, and, and I've, I've always been uh, really good with numbers on the spot so I can do the calculations. But yeah, it, it's also good for me. I like to do it manually because then I really know my numbers. If I just use a computer or a software and put it in, you know, oh, this is what you need. It's like, okay, no, I actually like to like really dig deep and do it myself manually because then I understand where all the numbers come from. Yeah, and I think with that, you you become really good at spotting stuff as well that you wouldn't quite so much. So if you know, it, like in your bones, hundred users, one CSM, cool. If you hear just the odd random little thing, like you know, oh, I've got a couple of appointments this week. You're like, if you're at full capacity, there's no chance that you'd have like a few hours every day to get out. Exactly. And like, like just knowing it in that intricately, I don't. Yeah, you wouldn't. Okay. Cool. You answered all my questions. Is there any mistakes, anything that you think our, our listeners would benefit from hearing about kind of how to manage your money that we didn't already cover? No, I, I think I, I kind of went through, obviously, we, we, you know, we, we keep these episodes within 15 to 17 minutes. But if anyone has any questions or anyone's going through anything, I, I love talking to entrepreneurs. Um, as I think I've mentioned on many of our shows, one of the things I had the luxury of doing was having a lot of entrepreneurs meet with me for coffee and kind of teach me to where I got today. So I'm more than happy to talk to anybody that's listening to this. Uh, Find me on LinkedIn, ask me any question, and I will reply right away. I do want to thank everyone for uh, listening. Uh, Another great episode, another great topic chosen by, actually, this one was chosen by Ollie. Um, And I want to thank everybody that um, is listening from everywhere, all around the world. Uh, If you enjoyed the show, as we always ask, please don't forget to give us a review, hopefully a five-star review, wherever you're listening from. And also subscribe so you don't miss our next show. We have a ton of new guests coming up in the next few months and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you again.